All right, well, this morning we're continuing again in Luke's gospel. Last time we were considering the great faith of the centurion and the fact that uh, we need to be strong in faith. It's those who are strong in faith to give glory to God, and uh, we should believe what the Lord says, and certainly we've been talking about that. We also saw how the Lord healed uh, the, uh, well, the, the widow's dead son, her last source of, of help and support in the world, and how the Lord had mercy on her by raising him from the dead so that she would have the support that she needed, but also reminding us that um, who Jesus is, he has the ability to give life to the dead, and not just physical life, but also spiritual life. Well, again, this morning what we're going to look at is the, um, uh, the account of John the Baptist sending his messengers to Jesus to find out again whether he is the Messiah. And again, we might think John the Baptist would be the last person in the world to ask that question. So we want to understand why he asked that question. And we want to understand what Jesus' response actually meant to him. And I think through this we want to see, of course, where the true source of our happiness comes from. And essentially it comes from trusting Jesus and believing that what he says is true and knowing that what's ahead of us is worth whatever we might have to endure in this world uh, to have. So let's read the text and then we'll, we'll get into this. So first of all, beginning in verse 18, the disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind." And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Well, may the Lord bless his, his word to our understanding this morning. Now, um, <clears throat> I, I just want to start off by, by mentioning something that I think is, is quite plain to all of us here. Uh, what it is, I think, that everyone in the world actually seeks after. And actually, I would say even <laughs> perhaps the animal kingdom seeks after this. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be satisfied. Everybody wants what they think and does what they do so that they might be happy. I think that applies to the particular directions that we go with our lives. I mean, for instance, one chooses to become a doctor, another chooses to become a lawyer, perhaps another a fireman or a police officer, because he or she believes that that particular career is the one that will bring them the greatest happiness, either because it'll make them the greatest amount of money, and uh, though many of us, oh, we, we know that money can't buy happiness, a lot of people aren't necessarily convinced by that. So if they can make a lot of money, they can buy the things they think will make them happy. Or maybe they go into these vocations because they're satisfying. You know, it helps other people. And it makes them happy to help other people. And I think that does give all of us a good feeling. I think we choose the recreations that we do for the same reason. I mean, why, after all, does one go to a football game but to have fun? or to concerts, or to the beach, or maybe uh, vacation. You know, why do we like to vacation? Well, it's because it's fun. You know, why do we like to go to other countries to do that? Well, because it's different than here, and there's a lot of exciting things that are there. Everybody wants to have fun. They want to be happy. Now, I don't think it should surprise us that the same thing is actually true with regard to the Christian life. The reason why we do the things we do is also so that we can be happy. That's the reason why we turn from our sins. That's the reason why we trust in Jesus. That's the reason why we follow him. Because we believe in the end, this will bring the greatest satisfaction, this will bring to us the greatest happiness and joy. Now, that doesn't mean that, that following Jesus is necessarily going to make us rich. As a matter of fact, we might actually uh, have a little leaner life. Uh, we may not... Uh, 
uh, have a lot, but we'll certainly have enough to get by. Uh, we, we may travel to other countries, to foreign lands, but it may not necessarily be for, for a vacation. We will certainly get to help other people, but other people may not necessarily like the kind of help that we give them. They might actually get angry at us. But following Jesus is actually a very hard road, isn't it? Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, in the world you have tribulation. And Paul also said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But we do it anyway because we know in the end it is going to lead to greater happiness. Now, the difference between us in the world is not that one of us is looking for pleasure and the other one is not. The difference is actually where we are looking for it. The world looks to the worlds. As far as their concerns, you know, if evolution is true, this is really all that there is. All we have are a few years here, and then when it's over, it's over. That's it. We basically decompose in our graves, and that's all that's left. But we look to Jesus because we know that there is more than this world. We know from the Word of God that there is a heaven. We know that there is a new world that God is going to create. And we know that what we do while we are in this world is going to influence our happiness in that world to come. We know that there are uh, differing degrees of reward. And we also believe that the way to get there, the source of our joy, is Jesus. Well, that's actually what Jesus is telling John the Baptist this morning as he's doubting and questioning and it's robbing him of joy and he's, he's wondering whether Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus says to him, if you want to be happy, then you need to believe that I am. He says, blessed or happy is he who does not take offense at me. Now, Luke told us earlier that John the Baptist had been arrested. We see that John is in, in prison here in Luke chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by John, by him, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Now, John understood that the way to true happiness was by doing the Lord's will, and it didn't necessarily make other people happy, and it didn't necessarily lead to immediate happiness. He was, after all, in prison, but he did know that it led to ultimate happiness, and that's why he did it. Well, John's work now was almost finished. John was in prison. He had already pointed the Jews to Jesus. He testified about him, who he was. He told the Jews they needed to follow him. He even said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John's work, as I've said, was almost over, not quite. Herod would still come to him, and he would talk with John, and he actually enjoyed talking with John, which is an interesting thing, and John continued to testify to him. But for the most part, his work was over. But... Though he was in prison, notice he was still interested in what Jesus was doing, the one he had pointed to. Matthew tells us that on one occasion, actually Luke tells us the same thing, that John sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, though, this question, are you the expected one? In other words, are you the Messiah? Are you the fulfillment of God's promises? Everything we read about in the Old Testament scriptures, are you the one I was pointing to, or do we look for someone else? Uh, now, that's sort of an odd question, isn't it, to come from John the Baptist? I mean, why did he, of all people, ask that particular question? Because think about John. I mean, wasn't he the one that God sent, the Lord sent before Jesus to prepare his way? Wasn't he the fulfillment of what the, you know, Malachi prophesied in, in the, the last book of the Bible? Wasn't he the one who was preaching fearlessly to the Jews that they should turn from their sins and be baptized with the baptism that he was baptizing with so that they might be ready to receive the one who was coming after him? Wasn't he the first to recognize Jesus as the Messiah when he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove from heaven and basically remaining on him? Wasn't John who said, when he pointed to Jesus in John 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sins of the world. It seems, at least then, he was fully convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. The question is, why was he now doubting? Well, some commentators say that John really wasn't doubting. He was just sending a couple of doubting messengers to Jesus in order to buttress their faith so that when they saw what he was doing and hearing what he was doing, uh, they would be, again, strengthened. But that doesn't seem to be the case. John sent the messengers with a question from John. John asked this question, and Jesus addressed his answer to John when he says in Luke 7, verse 22, to the messengers, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. These were John's doubts, and so Jesus addresses his answer to John. Now, I think what we need to see here is that um, <clears throat> as great as John was, and we're going to see just how great he was this evening in the very next passage when Jesus turns from talking to the messengers of John and he turns to the crowds and he begins to talk about who John was, or who he is actually, and how great he is, but how much greater someone else actually uh, is, okay? So... John is a great man, but as great as he was, he was still just a man, which means he was still liable to the weaknesses and to the infirmities that we have. Uh, he's not God in human flesh like our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, being in a Roman prison was not an easy thing to endure, especially when you consider how long he actually was in prison. It's estimated that John was there for close to two years before he was executed. Sometimes it seems like he was taken right off the scene and the execution came pretty quickly, but that wasn't the case. So that's one thing. But you add to that John's expectation, which, again, remember that a prophet didn't necessarily understand everything that they were prophesying about. We read in, at least in, in Peter, in his epistles, that the prophets would actually examine their own writings to see what time and what the Spirit of God was saying about the one who was coming. Even though they prophesied, they didn't fully understand, and we have to believe John also fell into this category. It's likely that John also had the same expectation that the Jews had, which is what made them stumble over Jesus as the Messiah, that the Messiah was coming to lead Israel to victory over the Romans. I mean, that's what his father, Zacharias, prophesied when, when, again, John was born and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Luke 1, verses 68 through 75, listen to what he says. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Now, don't understand redemption always as meaning, you know, spiritual redemption from sins. It can also mean redeemed from an enemy, saved from an enemy like the Romans, has accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant to us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Do you, under, do you know that, that most of the Jews understood this passage as referring to deliverance from Rome rather than deliverance from the devil, which is what Jesus actually came to do? So John may have been expecting a political Messiah, not a spiritual Messiah. And the fact that he had you know, languished for so long in prison was just evidence to him that the Jews had not yet been freed from Roman oppression. And so John was questioning, and I think he was wanting to know, was God's plan actually moving forward? Uh, did his life have meaning? Was his work for nothing? Had he faithfully carried out his role? Is this really the Messiah or is there somebody else we should be looking for? Now, I want, want you to notice too, secondly, that Jesus didn't reprove John and he also didn't disappoint him in his answer. When the messengers came to Jesus, he didn't just say, go back and tell John. The answer is yes. <laughs> but rather he proved through the evidence, okay, that he was the fulfillment of prophecy and that 
everything, he was everything John was expecting. They shouldn't look for anyone else. And he begins to point to the various ways in which his ministry actually was fulfilling the Old Testament Scriptures, which for John and any Jew who had the Spirit of God would be enough. He said, first of all, in verse 22, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 35, verse 5, Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. By the way, this is another messianic passage. And we've already read that when Messiah came, He would open the eyes of the blind. Jesus said, secondly, the lame walk. Isaiah writes in the same passage that I've just read in Isaiah 35, verse 6, the lame will leap like a deer. Jesus says the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised up. Now, there's no specific prophecy in the Old Testament regarding the Messiah's doing this particular work, but we do understand that, that cleansing lepers and raising the dead is something that only God can do, and He certainly would not give the power to do this to any deceiver. This man had divine credentials. Jesus says the deaf hear. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 35, verse 5, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And then Jesus says, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, this is a quote from Isaiah 61, 1, the one that we saw in our meditation. Isaiah writes, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Now, the interesting thing here is the word afflicted and the word poor don't seem to be the same word, but when you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament Scriptures, the word used there is the same word that Jesus uses in Luke chapter, well, in our passage this morning, the word that means poor. And by the way, gospel means good news. Jesus is saying, as Isaiah prophesied, so I am doing. Now, Jesus didn't just say he was the Messiah. He actually proved he was the Messiah with the kind of evidence that any Jew who was willing to look at the evidence with an unbiased heart, and of course, no Jew does, no person does. They're either going to be motivated by sin or by the Holy Spirit. But objectively, to look at this, they would have to admit Jesus did what the Messiah was supposed to do. As a matter of fact, he says as much in John 5, verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. I mean, John prophesied. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. Jesus did these works to prove he was the Messiah. And as we pointed out before, they were works of compassion. Uh, they were acts of mercy and not just evidences that he was who he claimed to be. God is a merciful and compassionate God, and his greatest mercy is in giving us his son so that we might have life. But then Jesus adds one more thing. This is the summary of what he's telling John. Verse 23, blessed is he who does not take offense at me, who doesn't stumble over me, okay? What I'm doing, who I am. John here, excuse me, Jesus here was ministering to John's doubt, and he was also ministering to our doubts that we might, you know, to all who might struggle in, in the future, because to the degree that we do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, to that degree, we are going to be robbed of our joy or any happiness we might otherwise have not only in knowing that our life actually has a purpose, it actually has meaning. We're not, just a, we're not just a cosmic accident here. And the things that are happening, you know, to us, the things that we're doing are not just going to disappear and vanish into history, but they have significance also for the future. That all derives from knowing that Jesus is who He said He is, not to mention the fact, the knowledge that our souls are safe because Jesus actually has save them, okay? So to the degree that we do not believe, to that degree, our happiness and joy is robbed. Jesus wanted to strengthen John's conviction, his faith that he was the Messiah so that he might have joy and happiness in serving him even in that dungeon, even in that Roman prison. That's mercy on the part of our Lord. He condescends 
to our weaknesses. By the way, Jesus really doesn't do what he does. He doesn't do miracles in order to necessarily, you know, uh, prove uh, to unbelievers that he's the Messiah, but rather to give evidence to those who belong to him who are his, that he is the Messiah, and that's what Jesus was pointing to. It also leaves the unbelievers without excuse. But this was a mercy to John to bolster him because Jesus is compassionate. Now, a couple of Lord's Days ago, Steve Lawson reminded us of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 through 24. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The Jews stumbled over Jesus for the reasons we've already seen. They were expecting a political Messiah. Uh, Jesus was <clears throat> a spiritual Messiah, even though his spiritual work would certainly affect the political realm. Uh, they were not expecting a Messiah who would go to the cross and die as a criminal. They were expecting a Messiah who would lead them to victory over the Romans. And so Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews, and they stumbled over him. Well, the Gentiles stumbled as well, didn't they? Because to them, the gospel seemed like foolishness, that God was one, that he would become man, that through Poverty, essentially, one could become rich, that through humiliation would come glory, that through death would come life, and that one who died would actually be raised from the dead. The Gentiles didn't believe, for the most part, because they didn't believe what the Bible said is true. But Paul also said there was a third category. There were those um, who believed, okay? They were the called, those who were raised by the Holy Spirit uh, from death to life. To them, Jesus was not a stumbling block. Jesus was not foolishness. But Jesus was the power of God and the wisdom of God, the one who has the power to save and the one who gives wisdom to live. Now, there's a couple things we need to uh, ask ourselves this morning. And I think the first question is this, what category? Do we fall in this morning uh, with regard to these three categories that Paul gave to the Corinthians? Are you like the Gentiles, trusting science? By the way, one thing that um, Ken Ham is going to bring out, and we, we have to see this distinction. It's very, very important. As Christians, we don't say all science is bad. You can't learn anything from science, you know. Uh, Bill Nye basically said, if you believe as Christians do regarding science, then you really can't discover anything that's going to be technologically uh, useful today. You can't invent anything. Well, that isn't true. That both of those statements are not true. We believe in science, observational science. We believe that we can learn things from the creation and make useful things. The real debate is over historic science, okay? What science believes actually happened in the past and how we got to where we are today, which is not something you can observe, but something you have to speculate about or you believe what God actually says. So the question is, are you trusting science with regard to the explanation of where the world came from? You know, the, the, the Gentiles, the Greeks, had all kinds of weird ideas about how we got here, about these great uh, titans, you know, that were fighting with one another or the fact that the world may have been made out of the carcass of one of these dead beings and that the gods were children of these beings. I mean, it's just, it's really another kind of evolutionary view. But there's really only two views, evolution and creation. And do you believe? Which do you believe? Do you believe like the Gentiles? Do you believe in evolution? Do you think the Bible then is foolish? Has the enemy tricked you into thinking there is no God? that there is no life after death, that there is no ultimate standard, that there is no judgment at the end of the, of the world, that this is all there is. And so if you're going to be happy, you've you got to find your happiness here and the things that are here, not in the hereafter. That's just, as Mark said, the, the opiate of the people to keep them sort of you know, doped so that they'll continue to do the will of, of the, uh, oh, the oppressors, essentially. Well, if that's what you believe, um, you may find a temporary happiness in this world, maybe. Not everybody gets it, right? 
But whatever you might gain here, you're eventually going to have to lose because when you die, you don't get to take it with you. And when you die, what the Bible says is true, you're going to have to face something far worse than just the taking away of what you had and certainly the simply going into nothingness. The Bible does talk about everlasting punishment. It's called God's judgment. Well, are you, on the other hand, like the Jews, okay? Jews were members of the church. Jews had the Bible. They had a certain understanding of, of uh, you know, God and, and His plan and so forth. Well, you can be a member of the church and still be like a Jew if you happen to find something about Jesus that's particularly offensive to you, something that you stumble over, okay? Are you offended by Him? Are you offended by what Jesus says in His Word? about what is right and what is wrong, about the fact that there's only way, one way to God and, and He is that way, about the fact that if you come to Him, you have to check your life at the door and you have to become His and you have to obey Him and serve Him and that that's what you're going to want to do because you love Him. Are you offended by the fact that He wants your devotion and He wants your love? Well, if that's offensive to you, what does that say about your spiritual condition? Those who are saved by the Lord, who have His Spirit, love Him. And John tells us they don't find His commandments to be a burden. Rather, they are a delight. Jesus says His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Or are you in the third category, a true believer? One who is turned from their sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ because you see in Him the wisdom of God and the power of God. Do you see that resurrection power at work in your life changing you into the same character and image of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's how we know that we've, we've really trusted in Jesus is the fact that we love Him, we love what He's like, and we want to be like Him, and that's what we're struggling to become. Well, if that is true of you, then the Lord says you have a happiness, you are blessed that you are not offended at Jesus, that you're not stumbling over Jesus. You are blessed because you have a joy, you have a happiness, you have a future that is going to last. Your sins are forgiven. God is your Father. You have been adopted into His family. And He says He will not only take care of you here in this world, but that He will also take care of you forever in the new world that He is going to make. And you know, another thing that's very comforting about this passage is we need to realize that John the Baptist was not a believer who became an unbeliever because he started to doubt who Jesus was. He was a Christian who was having doubts. He was a true believer. And true believers can have doubts. But Jesus didn't say, you go and tell John, he's out of the kingdom. Okay, that's not what Jesus said, right? He said, go and tell John this. Okay, give him all this evidence. Tell him what I'm doing so that he will know that, that I am the Messiah. He will know that his joy is complete. Well, we can also know that when we're tempted to doubt, that the Lord will come to us with what we need to bolster up our faith. He will give us that evidence, not only that he is a Savior, but that he is our Savior, that he really has saved us, and he will save us to the end. Jesus says, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. If you want to know this kind of happiness, there's only one way. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to turn from your sins. You have to place your whole hope of entering into heaven on Him and not on what you do, your good works, not on any other Savior, not any other, you know, uh, religion. You need to trust Jesus and you need to follow Jesus. You need to surrender to Him. You need to bow the knee to Him as Lord and do what He says. If that's true of you, then you are blessed because you are not offended at Jesus. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to, to help us search our hearts and see where we're at, particularly as we prepare to come to the table and celebrate Jesus.